Dr. Downing Liu, the Chief Quality Officer for the National Capital Region Medical Directorate. That's the network of military hospitals and clinics in the Washington, D.C. area. And for those of you in the audience who are a little too shy to ask me, this is an Army uniform. And I'm David Lane, a family physician and a rear admiral in the U.S. Navy Medical Corps. I'm the director of the Defense Health Agency's National Capital Region Medical Directorate. Thank you in advance to Eric and Tony Amador for candidly and courageously sharing your medical journey. You'll hear them in a few minutes. To paraphrase Bill Gates, we in the MHS believe our most unhappy patients are our greatest source of learning. And thank you also to Dr. Larry Chu and his team here at Medicine X for inviting us here. In the spirit of everyone included, thank you for including us. We hope to both learn from and contribute to this great event. Dr. Liu and I feel privileged to have this opportunity to tell you about our military health system, which is separate and distinct from our colleagues who work at the Veterans Health Administration and who generally care for service members after they leave the military. The principal mission of the MHS has been to provide health care to active duty servicemen and women wherever they are stationed and deployed. And because we operate in every clime and place around the globe, Military medicine has often been at the forefront of healthcare innovation, particularly in areas like aerospace and undersea medicine, vaccine development, and trauma care. In addition, I'm proud to say our military has also had an impressive track record as an agent for social change and inclusivity. And we've had several remarkable successes in creating this diversity for the good of the country. For example, the military quickly and successfully integrated races following World War II while the rest of the country struggled with it into the 1960s and 70s. And today's military reflects the diversity of our nation and integrates members of all races and ethnicities in working together. The 2014 Department of Defense Human Goals Charter reaffirmed that our nation was founded on the principle that each individual has infinite dignity and worth, and that we gain a strategic advantage through the diversity of our total force. And we strive to become a model of equal opportunity for all, regardless of race, color, sex, religion, sexual orientation, or national origin. We strive to be a meritocracy and promote our people based on their skills and performance. In fact, women have always contributed to our nation's defense since the founding of our country. From their non-combat roles in the Revolutionary War, to their more integrated roles in today's blurred combat zones, my fellow sisters in arms have been there. And to think, in 1976, I had just joined the Navy, and the first female cadets and midshipmen were entering the service academies. They graduated four years later and joined the active components. The full integration of women in combat roles is underway right now, and we've seen three women graduate from the tremendously difficult Army Ranger School all of whom receive the same pay and benefits as their male counterparts. And if active duty women choose to become mothers, they now receive a full 12 weeks paid maternity leave and safe and subsidized childcare for when they're ready to return to work. <laughs> <laughs> and in recent time, thanks to the courageous advocacy of members of the LGBT community, Americans from this group have also been increasingly welcomed to openly serve in our armed forces. In fact, in preparing for this talk, I learned the rainbow flag we recognize and rally around today was created in 1978 by an honorably discharged Army veteran, Mr. Gilbert Baker. And just as American society has come a long way on this issue, our military has come a long way too. The DOD repealed the don't ask, don't tell policy in 2011. We have taken time out every June since then to recognize and thank our LGB service members for the heroic sacrifices and contributions they've made to make our country safer. And we're proud to say the DOD has become so progressive on the societal issue that it was no big deal to the troops when President Obama recently appointed the openly gay Eric Fanning to be the 22nd Secretary of the Army. Moreover, and more recently, the Secretary of Defense changed DOD policies in order to attract and retain transgender men and women who wish to openly serve their country too. And we've convened numerous expert panels of healthcare providers and patients to ensure we provide quality care to this underrepresented group. We'd like to think that the military health system 
in support of our greater military has been as inclusive as the larger military. Our healthcare system aims, has similar aims as the rest of the country in that we aim to provide the best care possible, resulting in the greatest health of our population and all at the best value. And this is consistent with our national quality strategy. We in the military health system have one additional goal, though, and that's improved readiness. And so our quadruple aim of the military health system is to provide better care, attain better health, at better value, and maintain a medically ready force and a medical force that's ready to deploy in support of our nation's defense. With our quadruple aim in mind, we serve over 9 million beneficiaries each year at hospitals, at clinics, and at remote aid stations around the globe. We not only care for active duty service members, we care for their family members too, and for retirees and their family members. In fact, did you know the military health system delivers nearly 50,000 babies every year? Wow, 50,000 babies in the military health system each year. That's the population of Palo Alto, almost. And the pediatrician in me is thinking about all of those well baby visits and immunizations for those 50,000 babies each year. And along the way, our military physicians have become responsible for some of the greatest advances in medicine, both for the military and for the medical community at large. We've learned from our experiences during the wars and armed conflicts that uh, lessons learned over time, our modern trauma system has evolved in a way and has resulted tremendously in improved wounded survival rate even as more complex injuries are seen on the battlefield. In fact, today, a service member injured in Afghanistan can expect to be transported to a coordinary medical center such as Walter Reed or San Antonio Military Medical Center in under a week. And our injured service members can expect to survive well over 90% of the time thanks to innovative first aid at the point of injury, forward deployed combat trauma surgical teams, and a globally integrated network of critical care air transport teams. And once the wounded, ill, and injured are back in the U.S., their acute needs are taken care of, our multidisciplinary rehab teams provide them with state-of-the-art restorative care, addressing their physical, psychological, and spiritual needs, and supporting their family members as well. The high quality of care they receive allows many severely wounded service members to continue on active duty, or transition to other jobs in government or industry that allow them to continue to serve in other ways. But advances in military medicine have not been limited to just trauma care, transport, or rehab. Major Walter Reed, you may know, discovered the, the mosquito cause of yellow fever, and Navy Captain Robert Phillips is credited with de developing oral rehydration solution. And between the two of them, they must have saved millions of lives in the developing world. Well, that's right. And more recently, the John P. Murtha Cancer Center and the National Intrepid Center of Excellence, TBI and PTSD, both at Walter Reed, have made major contributions in their fields. So as I've, we tried to show, the MHS is an innovative, high-velocity learning organization providing global, universal access to care for active-duty beneficiaries and their families. It's pretty neat, right? Pretty cool, sir. But does a universal single-payer uh, system equate to everyone included? Will everyone in our system have equal access, equal outcomes, and equally high levels of satisfaction? Well, we certainly hope so. Especially when you consider that in America each year, racial disparities alone are estimated to account for 83,000 deaths at a cost of more than 57 billion. But that couldn't happen in our military health system, could it? Well, a 2009 study of military health system patients found that no significant difference in access to care, preventive services, or health status between white patients and minority patients. That said, when we do see racial or ethnic disparities, such as diabetes and asthma, or admissions for children of color, they appear less often and appear to be less statistically significant compared to what is commonly reported in civilian health systems. And mothers delivering in military health care facilities tend to choose to breastfeed their infants more than the U.S. population. And this is seen even across all races. And while we recognize a gap in breastfeeding practices between mothers of color and white mothers, this gap in our military health system is much more narrow. Women in our health system also tend to access preventive health care services, such as screening for breast, cervical, and colorectal cancer, at much higher race, rates than the rest of the population. And this increase is seen even stratified by race. 
And in terms of overall satisfaction, many studies indicate that satisfaction is usually consistent across gender, ethnic, and military rank. Our single-payer system works to eliminate or mitigate disparities when we see them, and we ensure universal access to care. Our active duty service members receive at least a living wage, as well as food and housing benefits, which helps allow them to live in safe neighborhoods with their families and access to healthy, nutritious food. Yet we too often see disparities along rank lines, which is somewhat of a proxy for socioeconomic status. This is especially true for patient engagement. In a design thinking study we did last year, we found junior enlisted felt less engaged in their health care decisions than more senior ranking patients. And while they were very satisfied with the care they received overall, we found young service members had low levels of engagement and they didn't share in decision making as much as they should. We think this is due to the inherent rank structure of the military superimposed on the pseudo rank structure between providers and patients. It seems these two forces distance our junior personnel from being empowered to advocate for their care when they become patients. We'd like to better help our patients engage with their providers and their health care system. And we'd like to do it in a way that helps providers and the clinic staff during their busy days. We've worked across the MHS to bring patients to the table through patient and family advisory councils, chief experience officers at many of our facilities, and we've expanded our healthcare resolutions program, which is a venue that allows patients and staff to respectfully resolve conflict in the spirit of full and transparent disclosure. And we're working on addressing that information gap through transparent reporting of our quality, safety, access, and satisfaction data, all of them available on our public websites. And when we do get to see our patients face to face, we're working on helping them communicate better by using a simple discussion guide. Our initial work in orthopedics in the National Capital Region indicates that our junior enlisted members report higher engagement and activation scores with the use of this guide. We also found that this was helpful for members of all ranks. Who would have thought that a simple piece of paper or text, or email for that matter, could so powerfully shape a patient's conversation with their care team. It's too early to tell if this is going to work in other clinical contexts, so stay tuned. As our system evolves, our goal is to identify and learn from disparities we don't know about and ultimately eliminate them. One such area on our radar screen now is learning how best to care for our transgendered patients. In fact, just this week, we held a summit at Walter Reed on improving the care of transgender service members in order to better understand the needs of this unique population. In other words, everyone included, for the good of the population, for the good of our nation's defense. And with everyone included, we remain committed to seeking opportunities to improve and provide care for our military patients. We'd like to close with a sincere thank you to Dr. Larry Chu, and his team at Medicine X for inviting us today. Thank you to all for including us in your quest to address disparities in healthcare and your dedication to achieving equitable healthcare for everybody. Thank you. Thank you.